bit like a science lesson, but that's intentional. The title is The God Who's Sovereign Over Creation. And, and I, thought it was, uh, I thought it was kind of timely because this week I've seen a lot of posts online about this whole idea of science versus religion. You know, back on March 13th, uh, Trump announced a national day of prayer in response to this whole COVID-19 stuff. And the, the response was, was very passionate. I don't know if you noticed that. In fact, I, I, uh, I, I posted yesterday in the, in the uh, Encouragers page, although I, I failed to see even a few days earlier, Marjorie had posted it as well, so you get a double, uh, a double hit with that, that uh, Governor Kemp and the Georgia leaders have set tomorrow as a time of prayer for the state. And immediately I see the response come back. Why are we, why are we, what is this uh, imaginary friend in the sky? We need to deal with this from a science perspective as if there's some mutually exclusive relationship, God and science. I wanted today to reconcile, if you will, God and science. And, and part of this is, is to recognize that prayer in a situation like we're dealing with right now and science are the most natural companions. And furthermore, we'll see that throughout scripture, God has said, I have created all things in part so that you may believe. Now, there is always going to be an element of faith, and I'll explain that in just a moment. God doesn't, God is not scientifically proven for, for the secular person. In fact, we cannot uh, apprehend God without the Holy Spirit first intervening. God has to open our hearts and eyes. There's a, you, listen, some of the, some of the uh, most brilliant people I know are atheists. Now, how, you say, how can that be? How can, how can somebody be so smart intellectually and yet not believe in a God? Well, they look at me and say, how can you believe in a God? They look at you and say, how can you believe in a God? How can, well, you seem like a reasonable person. How can you believe in a God? So there's always going to be an element of faith in the sense that God says, if, the, if you come to God, you have to first believe that he is, but he doesn't make that a blind belief. And so today what we're going to do is we're actually going to walk through what I would consider some proofs of God. Now, in science, the thing you have to recognize is the scientific method, which is what we're actually going to kind of take a look at, that you don't prove something. You actually fail to disprove it. Let me give you an example that you're familiar with. If you are a defendant in court, you are trying to, uh, you are trying to uh, defend yourself against a charge. Now, if you are successful, how do they come back with the verdict? Do they say you are innocent? No. The verdict is not guilty, which means we have not proven your guilt. That does not mean that we're stating your innocence. That's saying that based on all the evidence, beyond any reasonable doubt, guilt has been disproven. And that's the same way it is in science. In science, if, you, if you're trying to understand something, you design an experiment, you execute the experiment, you collect data, and what you're doing is you're not proving your hypothesis. You either fail to disprove it or you disprove it. You don't prove it. The Pollitt family. Join the meeting. <laughs> Welcome, Pollitt family. <laughs> All right. So, so as we go through this, the question that we have is, can God, the existence of God and his majesty and his sovereignty, can that be demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt and my and i'll just say that my statement up front is not just beyond any reasonable doubt but beyond any semblance of reasonable doubt and so let's jump into this we're going to start with some verses here so these are some references god does not he, he does not play hide and seek god does not say okay i've created creation and then he go, jumps behind a mountain and says 
good luck trying to find me. And then as you get close, he dodges left and right. That's not the way it is. Jeremiah 33, 2. This is what the Lord says. The Lord who made the earth, who formed and established it, whose name is the Lord, ask me, and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. I, I've made the comment before that if there is a speck in the universe, in the farthest reaches, if the, it, you see some of the images that are still coming out from the Hubble telescope, it's fascinating, these dust clouds and these galaxies. And if there is a speck in the farthest reaches of the universe that exists outside the sovereignty of God, then God is not sovereign. But he is. He is sovereign over everything. His, his mind, his comprehension is infinite. And he says, ask me and I'll tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. Psalm 139, we're familiar with this psalm. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Now think about this. David had such a, a, a almost nothing understanding compared to what we have today of the human body. David was not able to look into the, into the structure of a single cell. David did not understand how an eye works. Now, he understood the function of the eye, but there's so much. David did not have DNA in the sense of the understanding of that. And yet, even without all of that, David says, you made all the delicate inner parts. It's wonderfully complex. Nehemiah 9, 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Have you ever seen the video that shows a, a lady lying on a, on, a, on a lawn? She's lying on a lawn, staring up at space. And the video starts zooming out. And then the, the woman, as the, as, you, as the perspective zooms out, the woman becomes a speck. And then you see the the United States, and it becomes a speck. And then you see the Earth, and it becomes a speck. And then you see the solar system, and it becomes, and it just keeps progressively going out further and further and further until the entire galaxies have become a speck. And then at a certain point, it zooms back in, and you see the galaxy, and the solar system, and the Earth, and, it, and then it comes down to the lady again, and it zooms into her eye. And then you see the pupil. And then it starts going down further and further. And you realize the level of complexity and the beauty and the majesty of all of creation. And that's what Nehemiah is saying. You made the heavens, the heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it. So scripture is very clear. We are not here by accident. Now, so far, I'm reading scripture to you. So far, we're taking this on faith. So let's start, as I say, reconciling faith and science. Now, some of you may, if, if you recall, uh, about seven or eight years ago, this is a variation to a, a talk that I gave to the youth group. Um, so some of this, you might be thinking to yourself, I've heard that before, and that's, that's probably... That's probably the case. But let me start with this uh, little bit of information from National Geographic. 1977, scientists were exploring the Galapagos Rift and down in the depths of the ocean in the Eastern Pacific. Okay, so they're in the, in the belly of the ocean. This was 1977 now. This is just, this wasn't that long ago. And as they're getting down there, they noticed that the temperature at the bottom of the ocean started to spike from almost freezing to nearly 750 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that all about? How can, how can all of a sudden we get this, this, this temperature spike at the bottom? 
Well, they made a fascinating discovery. Deep sea hydrothermal vents. National Geographic, without alluding to anything religious, said this stunning discovery changed everything we know about the Earth and life on Earth. An entire ecosystem was developed, or excuse me, was discovered down at the bottom of the ocean. Species had never been seen before were thriving because they convert these toxic minerals into, into forms of energy. It was called chemosynthesis. And, and, and all these animals are living at the bottom of the ocean. Here's how they described it. They said these hydrothermal vents are like geysers. Or here it is. I want you to catch the word. Hot springs on the ocean floor. Hot springs on the ocean floor. Now, why would I emphasize that? I'd emphasize it because of this. It's generally recognized that the oldest book in the Bible is what? Job. Job is the oldest book in the Bible, even though it occurs after the writings of Moses, that is that Job existed in the age of the ancient fathers, but the book itself is considered to be the oldest written part of scripture, Job 38. Let's see what Job 38 had to say long before 1977. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? Who supports its foundations? Who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together? And the angels, all the angels shouted for joy. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? And as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness. For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, thus far and no farther will you come. Here your proud waves must stop. This is why I take, I put no stock in the, this whole idea of the, the earth being flooded from global warming. It's not going to be that. God said himself, here your proud waves will stop and they will go no farther. Verse 12, have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath a seal. It is robed in brilliant colors. The light disturbs the wicked and stops the arm that is raised in violence. And here is where it comes together. The Lord asked Job, have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? How can that be? How can it be that the oldest written scripture refers to something that was not discovered until 1977 and the scientists, not the theologians, the scientists who discovered it said, this changes everything. Changes everything for whom? We've had the scriptures from, from the day we were born. And God said, have you explored the springs from which the seas come? How did they know there were springs in the depths of the ocean? Here's how. Because God put them there. So it's not a matter of blind faith. Okay, let's go through four points now that will give you, number one, give you confidence that science and religion are not opposing camps. That science and religion go hand in hand. You know, as New York's Governor Cuomo said, hey, everything's getting better, not because of some God, but because of what we have done. Ooh, that's a bit of hubris that I wouldn't venture into. God is sovereign over what you have done. God's sovereign over what I have done. Scripture says that God directs the heart of kings like a river. To think about, it's, it's, 
you know, the picture in my mind is like an earthworm popping up out of the ground, looking at me, and if it had a finger, shaking its finger in my face. And I'm looking at it saying, what, what are you kidding me? You're an earthworm. I can stomp on you. You're nothing. Okay, so here we go. Number one, it's called irreducible complexity. What is irreducible complexity? This simply refers to the fact that some things do not assume a function until all the pieces are together. Okay, simplest example is a mousetrap. If you look at a, a basic mousetrap, what are the what are the basic parts of a mousetrap? Okay, you've got the wooden plate, right? You got the base. You've got a spring that provides the tension. You've got a, a bar that eventually catches the mouse. You've got a, a, a catch that holds it. All right, there are like five or six pieces of a mouse trap. Take away any one piece and you don't have a mouse trap. You have a collection of pieces. Take away the spring, for example. Okay, you've got all the pieces except for the spring. How are you gonna catch a mouse? Take away the base. You have all the metal pieces. How are you gonna catch the mouse? The fact is, there's no partial functionality to a mousetrap. You either have a complete functional mousetrap or you have parts that don't even get close to being a mousetrap. It's not like it's gonna slowly snap on the mouse. It's not like it'll sort of hold them. It won't do anything until you have it all together. That's called irreducible complexity. You cannot reduce it any further. Okay, now, why, why is this important? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's quote Darwin a couple times today. Darwin is the genesis of all this idea of evolution that goes against an intelligent designer. What does Darwin have to say? Well, Darwin talks, uh, Darwin talks about the I. The simple I, right? No, it's not simple. Darwin says this, quote, to suppose that the I, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems I, I freely confess absurd in the highest possible degree. <laughs> now, Darwin is the one who's giving us this whole idea of natural selection, and he himself said, you know, when I think about the eye, to think that that could have come together from evolution is pretty stupid. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. Well, then how do you come up with this? All right, what else did Darwin say? It's wonderful when you start reading his actual works and you realize that the best way to refute Darwin is by using Darwin. <laughs> Here's what else he said, quote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can find out no such case. Now, the reason he couldn't find out any such case was because he did not understand how an eye worked. They didn't have that knowledge then. He didn't understand how a cell worked. You got to be careful about that. How about this? Let's talk about the eye for just a second. I used to work about 10 or 15 years ago. I worked with a fella out of Tarpon Springs, Florida. His name's Dr. James Gill. Uh, doc, Dr. Gill founded the uh, Tarpon Springs Institute of Cataract Surgery. He was, he was one of the foremost eye doctors in the world. Um, and he wrote a book about the eye, naturally, because he's an eye doctor. And by the way, Dr. Gill is a, is a very passionate evangelistic believer. So uh, it, it's, it's, you know, this, uh, this is not non-scientists coming up with a good excuse. This guy is arguably one of the world's leading eye surgeons. Uh, and, and he talks about the eye. Here's what he says. The retina is a multi-layered sensory tissue that lines the back of the eye. 
Now, you might probably remember some of this from biology, but I'll just give you a couple paragraphs. It's not long. It contains millions of photoreceptors that capture light rays and convert them into electrical impulses. Okay, listen to the numbers. Millions of photoreceptors that capture light rays and convert them into impulses. These impulses travel along the optic nerve to the brain where they are turned into images. These transmissions occur more than 30 times per second in each cell. <laughs> there are two types of photoreceptors in the retina, rods and cones. We remember this, right? The retina contains approximately 6 million cones. The cones are contained in the macula, the portion of the retina responsible for central vision. They're most densely packed within the fovea, the very center of the macula. Cones function best in bright light and allow us to appreciate color. Now think about this. There are all these photoreceptors that have a specific purpose, light and color. Now we also have about 125 million rods. They are spread throughout the peripheral retina and function best in dim lighting. The rods are responsible for peripheral and night vision. Ready for this? A single defect in any of the many cellular proteins can lead to a blinding disease. In other words, these 125 million rods, 6 million cones, must function perfectly in unison. One of them that doesn't work, and you're leading toward blindness. 125 million and 6 million that must simultaneously come together in irreducible complexity. Now, to, to, you, th those numbers are hard to wrap our heads around. So let me give you some numbers that you can wrap your head around. Let's say that I had a bookshelf. And on this bookshelf, I had 15 books. That's easy. You've got 15 books, I'm sure. Here's the question. How many different ways can you arrange 15 books. So you've got 15 books and you place them in a particular order. Now, you, you shuffle them around, you put them in a different order. How many different ways can you arrange 15 books? I'll let you think about that for a second. Some of you may know how to calculate that, but in your mind, you're probably thinking, oh man, I don't know, 100,000, 30,000? I mean, I got 15 books. How many ways can I order 15 books? You ready for this? 1.3 trillion. If I had 15 books, there are 1.3 trillion possible ways to order them. So what do you think if I were to have 15 books and you were to take the same 15 books and behind a curtain, I were to arrange them in a certain order, and I would ask you to do the same thing. What do you think the chances are we, our arrangements, our order would be exactly the same? The answer is one in 1.3 trillion. In other words, it will never happen, no way, no how, statistically impossible. And yet we're led to believe that 131 million rods and cones miraculously organize themselves in a spontaneous functioning order. I don't think so. And this one's actually, I have fun with this one. This one's, I have fun with all of them, but this one's a lot of fun. There's this thing called a bombardier beetle, a bombardier beetle. Now, this beetle is an interesting beetle. It's it is, it's got this defense mechanism <clears throat> that their name comes from. When, when this beetle is disturbed, they eject a hot, in fact, a boiling hot, noxious chemical spray from the tip of their abdomen with a popping sound. Now, how does this happen? Well, here's what happens. In the abdomen of the bombardier beetle are two separate reservoirs. And these two reservoirs each contain a unique chemical. And what happens is when the beetle is disturbed, it will initiate a mixing of these two chemicals. And so what happens is these two chemicals go and, and come together in, in an explosive exothermic reaction. In other words, 
You got a chemical in one part of the abdomen and a chemical in the other part of the abdomen. And the beetle just says, okay, get away from me. It mixes them. It explodes, pops out. Now, here's my question. How in the world can you have evolution with a bomb in your beetle? Because it requires that these two reservoirs stay separate. Think about this. You've got a bombardier beetle in the stages of evolution, but the problem is their reservoirs aren't quite fully formed yet. So this bombardier beetle's walking along, boom, explodes. Now what do you do? You got another bombardier beetle. This bombardier beetle, he's trying to get his reservoirs separate because that's how evolution works, right? Every one of these guys with an imperfect reservoir system is going to blow up. All right, now let's assume, let's give it a lot of latitude here and assume that we get one bombardier beetle that has managed to overcome this evolutionary hurdle. <sighs> I got those two chemicals separate. What's got to happen now? He's got to find a mate. So he finds another bombardier beetle. And just about the time they get to mate, she blows up. Okay, I'm joking about this, but the, it doesn't. This is, this is silly to the point of you can't even take it seriously. How can you have a bombardier beetle that's only partially formed? Because the whole nature of this creature is that there has to be fully functional discrete parts right from day one or else you have nothing but a smoldering insect. Okay, so the first one that we've talked about is irreducible complexity. Number two, let's talk about this. The magnificent cell. See, Darwin didn't know anything about cells. The, the, the idea of how the human body is created, this is what David was saying. You have made me wonderfully complex. What does wonderfully complex mean? Let's think about this. The human body has more atoms then the universe has stars. Do you ever look up in the night sky? The human body has more atoms than the universe has stars. Our bodies, on average, have about 60,000 miles of blood vessels. Within our body, about 60,000 miles of blood vessels. The average person will breathe 630 million times. The human eye blinks over 400 million times. The human eye that we've already talked about that can distinguish millions of color shades faster than any known or imagined supercomputer instantly. Our bodies, which contain over 10 trillion cells, those 10 trillion cells initially derive from a single solitary cell and that one cell is comprised of approximately one trillion atoms. Our minds can't wrap around this. One cell with one trillion atoms splitting into over 10 trillion cells of over 200 different types. You see what I said? We start with one cell and it knows how to replicate itself, not as its own cell, but as 200 different types of cells so that that one cell with over a trillion atoms eventually becomes over 10 trillion cells with over 200 different types. See, Darwin didn't know anything about this. Darwin, to Darwin, this was a black box. It was just there, but he didn't know how. In 1953, the double helix DNA was discovered. Now, today, we just know about DNA. We know DNA sampling. We've got Ancestry.com. What is DNA? Well, DNA from a single cell. Remember how small that cell is? The DNA from a single cell measures over five feet long. One DNA strand is only 50 trillionths of an inch wide. All DNA removed and stretched from the human body, if you were to take the DNA from the human body, extract it, extract it and stretch it out, would range to be about 150 billion miles. <laughs> I, I'm only touching the surface of what David was talking about when he said, you have, you've woven my 
my, my inmost parts. You've made me. David understood this by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Now, David, I'm sure David didn't know that if, you know, a single strand of DNA was five feet wide. That's not necessary. We understand it now, and it only adds to our amazement of what David was talking about. David looked at that. David was thinking to himself again. David, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, I can't believe this. Why is it that you would even consider me? I look up at the stars, and I think about how you've created me. He understood this. And the more that God reveals himself through science, that should not drive us away from religion and, 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 and into some misguided ego. It should drive us deeper into the word and just opening it with amazement and saying, wow, God, what have you done? Give you one more example of improbability. That's the Rubik's Cube. Dating myself here. You guys know what the Rubik's Cube is. Rubik's Cube is a three by three cube, nine squares on each side. If you were to mix up a Rubik's Cube and then randomly move the cube one time every second, one time a second, it would take over 1.4 billion years to come to a solution. That's it. A three by three cube. One move every second would require, excuse me, I said 1.4 billion. No, <laughs> 1.4 trillion. It's 1,350 billion years to solve. Now, what does that difference does that make? Well, uh, if we accept the age of the universe as given to us by the scientists, I'm not saying I'm not saying we accept it at face value, but let's just say we did. Most people say that the universe is 15 billion years old. That's what the general scientific consensus is. The universe is 15 billion years old. That means that just to solve a Rubik cube would require over 300 times the age of the universe. Now let me ask you, does that? pass the logic test, not even close. Number three, this one is called the second law of thermodynamics. Now, this is the scientific name, but it's, it's really easy to understand. This law basically says that everything that exists moves from order to disorder, okay? If I, if I, have, a, if I have a shed in my backyard, and I give it a fresh coat of paint. What will it look like if I just left it alone? What will it look like if I come back in 30 years? There'll be no paint left. It has moved from a state of order to a state of disorder. If I leave a car sitting next to the beach, just leave it there, and I come back in 10 years, the car will be rusted. There is never an instance where I could take a rusty car and set it out in the field and come back in a hundred years and it's a brand spanking new car. That, we, we intuitively, we understand that that happens. Now, whether we recognize it as an immutable law of the universe or not, doesn't make any difference. It is a law of the universe. And there's no evidence that that law was ever suspended, which means it's always been that way. Now, sometimes people will say, ah, ah, but wait a second, wait a second. How about a snowflake? A snowflake has beautiful complexity, right? So it goes from a, a drop of moisture to complexity. Or they'll say, if you, if you walk along a beach and you see the waves coming in on the sand, that you've got these beautiful, these beautiful um, patterns in the sand. Yeah, well, that's true. But what we're talking about is not just the pattern. We're talking about what's called specificity. And here's what I mean by that. There's complexity and there's specificity. A, a, a snowflake has complexity. But have you ever seen a snowflake that looked like Donald Trump? <laughs> or looked like you? <laughs> 
That would be specificity. That would be complexity with a purpose. We can walk along a beach and we can see these beautiful patterns in the waves. But have you ever walked along a beach and seen that the waves have carved in the value for pi? Look at that, 3.1. No, that would be specificity. And the, 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 the point here is there are some natural processes that do generate complexity, but they've never written a book. They've never created a, a dwelling. You've never seen a spontaneous vehicle out in the middle of nowhere. The implications of the second law of thermodynamics are considerable because here's what it says. The universe is constantly losing usable energy and never gaining. Think about a battery, okay? You have a battery. What happens to that battery over time? It eventually discharges until it has no more usable energy, right? But here's why this is so important. Go backwards in time. Okay, I've got a battery right now that's half charged. If I go forward in time, it won't have any charge. But contemplate going backward in time. And what you're going to find is you're going to get to a point of maximum charge when that battery was initially created. That battery started with a full charge. And the second law of thermodynamics says that eventually that battery just goes out. Now think about the implications for creation. If we know, and there's not a scientist on earth that disputes this, if we know that the second law of thermodynamics says that everything is moving from a state of order to a state of disorder and that usable energy is running out, let's go back in time. The, the only logical conclusion is that at some point in time, there was a moment of maximum energy. And you know what? For an evolutionist, that is really, really problematic. But for a creationist, for those of us that believe in scripture, it's simple. In the beginning, God created. God created at a moment in time. He created. He gave order. NASA astronomer Robert Jastrow wrote a book. It's called God and the Astronomer. His name's Robert Jastrow, and this will be in my notes, so you'll see this as well. He says this, quote, Theologians generally are delighted with the proof that the universe had a beginning, but astronomers are curiously upset. <laughs> It turns out that the scientist behaves the way the rest of us do when our beliefs are in conflict with the evidence. Do you hear what he said? He's not saying that this is just an, a belief. He's saying we have evidence of a maximum point of energy, which theologians, they, we, we call that creation. But non-believing scientists, that's really problematic. And then he says this, quote, For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason alone, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Man, think of that picture. You've, you've done everything to scale the peak, only to find that in that moment, the scaling wasn't necessary because it was said from the beginning, in the beginning, God. Number four. Number four, we're going to talk about the fossil record. And again, I'm going to quote Darwin. Darwin says this, quote, But just in proportion, as this process of extermination has acted on an enormous scale, so what he's saying here is we see species and then these species are gone. 
so must the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed on earth be truly norm enormous. Okay, so here's what he's saying. If we have all these species and then they start disappearing, they, or, they, or they start appearing, either one, then if we do in fact have evolution, then to get from this species to this species, there must be an enormous number of inter, intermediate steps, right? That's, that's the basis of evolution. This says that a giraffe has a long neck because a giraffe used to have a short neck. And a giraffe has a long neck because that giraffe has to reach up to the, up to the top leaves. Although I don't understand how the ones that didn't reach up to the top leaves ever survived without eating, but nevertheless. So we've got to have the short neck giraffe, the sort of longer neck giraffe, the intermediate neck giraffe, the longer intermediate neck giraffe, the long, long, long neck giraffe to today's giraffe. But we don't. But then he says this. I'm getting back to Darwin now. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. Listen carefully to the next phrase. And this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. Darwin was saying, the fact that the fossil record is not replete with millions of intermediate forms of various species, he says, that is my biggest problem. As geologists explore this, they eventually came to recognize, see at first Darwin thought that the reason that we didn't have all these was because we didn't dig enough. And for him that might have been true. But that's not the case anymore. The, 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 ever since Darwin, geological formations have been explored all over the world and those gradual intermediate steps still don't exist. In fact, it gets even worse for the evolutionist. What they found was the more they dug and the more they looked for those evolutionary steps, they found exactly the opposite. And they gave it a name. They call it the Cambrian Explosion. And what they found was almost every major animal group burst into existence in a very short time, according to the fossil record. I'm going to say that again. The fossil record does not show gradual evolution. The fossil record shows that all major, almost every major animal group didn't come in over time. It burst onto the scene, hence the name the Cambrian Explosion. Evolutionary biologist Jeffrey Leventon, he still believes in the common ancestry of animals, but he says this. In 1992, he wrote, this Cambrian Explosion, or life's Big Bang, or shall we call it creation? Quote, remains evolutionary biology's deepest paradox. Huh. Like Jastrow said, in the face of evidence that crosses their belief, what is their belief? Their belief is there cannot, there cannot be a God. Therefore, there must not be a God. Therefore, if there must not be a God, how do I take the evidence and compress it into a worldview that precludes God. And the problem is it doesn't fit. He said it is evolutionary biology's deepest paradox. Let me finish with a couple things here. I like some quotes. Werner von Braun, I, I, some years ago, I did a study on Werner von Braun we did some, uh, when we did some biographies. And if you remember, Werner von Braun was the father of American space program. He was the, he was the uh, lead scientist on the Redstone rocket, which got us to the moon. He was a, he, he, he was a uh, German immigrant. His family escaped the Nazis, came over here, ended up in Alabama of all places. But he said this, they, the evolutionists, challenge science to prove the existence of God. But must we really light a candle to see the sun? 
They say they cannot visualize a designer. Well, can a, can a physicist visualize an electron? What strange rationale makes some physicists accept the inconceivable electron as real while refusing to accept the reality of a designer on the grounds that they cannot conceive him? He was arguably our leading rocket scientist. And then he says, he also said this, I love, I love this as well. To be forced to believe only one conclusion, that everything of the universe happened by chance would violate the very objectivity of science itself. What random process could produce the brains of a man or the system of the human eye? And then Blaise Pascal, great scientist from days past, in fact, he came up with Pascal's Wager. Uh, I don't have this in the notes, so I'd encourage you to look that up. It's a great, it's a great logic uh, challenge. It's called Pascal's Wager. But Blaise Pascal said this, faith is different from proof. The latter is human. The former is a gift from God. It is the heart which perceives God and not the reason. That is what faith is. God perceived by the heart, not by the reason. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we abandon faith in, in our acceptance of the God of science and the God of creation. What I'm saying is it is foolishness in the absolute extreme to, ex to ex exclude God in the pursuit of reason. But, you know, it's still, it always boils down to one key question. We talked about this last week. What are you going to do with Jesus? You see, nobody is saved by understanding the arguments against evolution. You can understand we've got 125 million, 131 million rods and cones. That doesn't save you. What saves you is what we talked about last week, that Christ died, was buried, and on the third day he rose again. And today he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And that he will be back, probably sooner than later. But today, the reason for today is so that there is nothing in your experience that would ever cause you any doubt beyond a reasonable any extreme shadow of doubt, you should be able to look at creation and say, there is a God. Stephen Jay Gould died in 2002, sadly, was one of the contempor our contemporary culture's most renowned atheist. And he said this, if you absolutely force me to bet on the existence of a conventional anthropomorphic deity, of course I'd bet no. I'd be real surprised if there turned out to be a conventional God. He says, I remember a story about Clarence Darrow, and, uh, who was quite atheistic. Somebody asked him, suppose you die, and your soul goes up there, and it turns out the conventional story is true after all. Stephen Jay Gould said, Darrow's answer was beautiful, and I loved the way he pictured it with the 12 apostles in the jury box. He was just going to walk up to them, bow low to the judge's bench and say, gentlemen, I was wrong. Wow. He may very well do that, but the problem is at that point, his opportunity to believe has passed. And rejecting God means separation from God. Yeah, it's, what if it's true? What if it is true? But how can we know? God has shown himself throughout creation. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Why don't we accept the truth? 
we suppress it. Our disobedience suppresses our understanding. Verse 19, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. That is exactly what we were talking about for the last hour. God's existence is obvious. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. I, I, I'd, I'd hate to picture that person who crosses over into eternity and says, but, but you never gave me evidence in God laying this out before them and saying, what other conclusion could you have possibly made? The likelihood of God not being God, of not being sovereign, is so impossibly small I would say it doesn't exist. Therefore, God does exist. 